Ankylosing spondylitis. This is a disease where the back gets stiffened and you have back pain. It has some systemic issues as well. Ankylosing refers to fusion as this disease process uh, continues on and, and uh, gets to the end stages. You can actually see it on an x-ray where there's ossification and fusion between the vertebrae. So all the vertebrae just become basically one unit and it's called bamboo spine appearance. And then spondylo means back, spine, and then itis means inflammation. So <clears throat> that's a pretty good description within the disease name. So the disease process usually starts between 20 and 30, definitely between before 40. <clears throat> and it usually starts with the sacroiliac joint where the sacrum and the ileum meet. That's usually the first symptom and you have pain there. And a lot of times it'll work kind of up into the spine and start to get the facet joints. So, you know, your vertebrae have an intervertebral disc between them, but they actually have little connections called facet joints. And those can actually ossify and, and a lot of inflammation at those joints. We have costovertebral joints where the ribs come around and insert on the thoracic vertebrae. Those can become inflamed and eventually ossify. We have, um, you know, the joints that come around the front, the costovertebral joints, all that can kind of um, have issues as well. <clears throat> so there's a Callens criteria um, because at first you don't see this on x-ray. You don't see it on a normal MRI. So if a clinician picks up on some of these symptoms, they might do a specific type of MRI and then they can figure out that they have this disease. So. Uh, Callan's criteria, <clears throat> less than 40, the onset of symptoms, a lot of times, um, and then morning stiffness. They get up and it's just super tight in their back and hips, and it takes them like an hour just to be able to get to where they can put their socks on. Better with exercise, so as they start moving, the, the, the symptoms kind of subside, and they have low back pain for greater than three months. And a lot of times, not you'll see this in white males, so that's the most common demographic. A third of the time you'll see peripheral joint pain. A lot of times it may be like a hip or something like that. Enthesitis is really common in this disease. This is where ligaments like between the vertebrae they attach to each other or uh, muscles around the axial skeleton. So like the quadratus lumborum where it inserts into the ilium or where it has little insertions into the transverse processes of the lumbar spine. It's inflamed right there where it inserts. And so you have enthesitis or inflammation of the tendon as it inserts in or the ligaments between the vertebrae. Those can get where they insert. It can be um, painful. 90% <clears throat> of people with ankylosing spondylitis have HLA-B27 in their blood. So um, kind of can making that connection to an autoimmune disease and there's a lot of inflammation in the body, so it shows up uh, on other blood factors. So you can see it as erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR, and uh, C-reactive protein. A lot of times you'll see these elevated. They have a loss of hip mobility, especially the, the hip flexors. They get contracted. There's a test you, you can do to test the hip flexor mobility called Thomas test, where you lay a patient off the table and um, if they're positive for that, especially if they go to physical therapy, which would be needed, they can address that deficiency. Um, impaired chest wall excursion. You have all these, uh, all these joints ossifying. So you have the ribs connecting to the thoracic vertebrae forming bone. You have the facet joints between the vertebrae forming bone. You have the connections of the annulus of the inter intervertebral disc where it attaches forming bone and you just get really really tight so when you inhale you can have a, like a restrictive lung disease because you just can't get enough you know of the Boyle's law going with uh, um, enough volume in your thoracic rib cage to draw air in <clears throat> there's actually a test where you can measure at the fourth intercostal space with a measuring tape have them inhale as much as they can and it should go more than two and a half centimeters. If they have ankylosing spondylitis, they may have less than two and a half centimeters of full excursion. So um, another test that can be done, it's called the Schober's test. 
The shoulders test is where you mark at the low back two, two spots 15 centimeters apart and you ask the person to go down, touch their toes and stretch as much as they can. A lot of times with ankylosing spondylitis, as things fuse, they lose their uh, thoracic lordosis, that natural curve in your low back coming forward, and they get an increased thoracic kyphosis and forward head. And so they don't get good reversal of that lordosis when they go and stretch down. And so if it's less than a five centimeter increase from that 15, so if it doesn't get at least to 20, that's a very good sign that they have ankylosing spondylitis. And that's another thing in physical therapy they can do is try to maintain that good posture. You know, you can lay on a foam roller horizontal and really get a good thoracic extension stretch and try to offset that tendency to go into a, a thoracic kyphosis. <clears throat> so there's a, the specific MRI that you have to do early on to catch on to this is called a short tau inversion recovery sequences MRI. And you can actually see cartilage changes and bone marrow edema indicative of this particular disease. Um, a lot of times patients will have systemic disease as well, like about a quarter of the patients with ankylosing spondylitis have inflammation in their iris called uveitis, where it gets red and hurts and blurred vision and, you know, seeing um, things and everything. So um, what can you do <clears throat> if you have this disease besides the physical therapy? You know, initially, physical therapy with some NSAIDs, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are pretty good, like endomethacin, but there's actually some DMARDs, which are called disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, and um, the biologics are monoclonal antibodies, and these can actually help to decrease a cytokine called tumor necrosis factor alpha and basically that these monoclonal antibodies will go and negate the effect of that tumor necrosis factor alpha. A pretty common one used here is adalumumab, abilumumab, uh, infliximab, and then another one that's not a monoclonal antibody but similar, it's still a biologic, is intercept. Or, uh, and so these, these are nice because they can actually slow down the progression of the disease before these monoclonal antibodies came about, these biologics, um, it was just kind of a progression that you just kind of treated the symptoms. But here we finally have something that we can slow down the progression of the disease.